Have Ways of Making You Talk presents One Man's Window, an illustrated account of 10 weeks of war, Malta, April 13th to June 21st, 1942, by Dennis Barnum. Chapter 5, First Day. After the AOC's talk, our airman driver plunged our dilapidated bus, without lights, down from the Medina hilltop, through a nightscape of peculiar silhouettes, and delivered us outside the palace of another hilltop town called Naxar. By the light of hastily struck matches, we groped around for our luggage in the square hall, which smelt of cooking fat and drains. We felt our way up the stone staircase before Scotty made a discovery, half a burnt candle. In an oasis of light, we moved as a body through shadowed staterooms, picking our way carefully between the huddled sleeping shapes that covered the floor. As empty beds were found, the CO allocated them to individual pilots, until finally there were only three of us left. The dreaded Hugh and I, as the two flight commanders, were accommodated in a small room in the outside corner of the palace, before the CO, wishing us a silent good night, took the candle and crept away, searching for a bed for himself. Amongst the bedclothes I lay horizontally vulnerable, wearing my tin hat. All night long it went on. I tried to control myself as stick after stick of bombs shrieked overhead. Abrupt and terrible crashes tossed the palace. Silence was of exquisite purity between avalanches of sound. Heavy anti-aircraft guns sighted nearby spoke in fury. Prolonged echoes roared amongst the hills, fading gradually to be cut short by fainter gun crashes or bomb rumbles in the distance. There was almost continuous droning and gushings of air. Gun flashes and bursting high explosive alternately lit up the facade of the Golden Church on the far side of the road, or revealed its proud silhouette just outside the window. I lay as a creature hypnotised. I clutched at the sheets and stared in terror at the flickering line of jagged knuckles on the back of my hands. Dawn gave us a brief respite. As we ate our breakfast once again, the bombs screamed and the palace shuddered. Yesterday we arrived here, now mid-morning on Tuesday, April the 21st. We are in G-Shelter, waiting to play our part in the battle. Squadron Leader Gracie appears in the narrow entrance at the end of the cavern. He and his parachute seem to be stuck there. Bursting through, he tossed his chute onto one of the wooden benches, then turns and glares at us. Just shot down 288s, he snaps. They fell in the sea in formation. Fifty Spitfires, the AOC said, but most of the Spitfires are already out of action. Some shot down, others damaged. Even Gracie's machine will have to be repaired before it flies again. On our aerodrome, there are three left. The CO and I, as the two most experienced pilots of our squadron and anxious to get going, ask Gracie to take us up on the next raid. He agrees. We are committed now. Overwhelmed by my ignorance of how to fight against odds of 30 or 40 or 50 to 1, I stare at Gracie, for he is obviously brilliant at air fighting. Sir, I ask him, what are the best tactics to use? Gracie stares at me. I shrivel inside, for I'm aware that my question is hopelessly broad and vague. You'll learn, he replies, but don't go chasing the bees all the way to Sicily. If we're separated from you, with formations of 109s around, what's the best technique then? The CO and I both lean forward to listen. If you're by yourself, weave around at naught feet all over the island, or better still, do steep turns in the middle of Takali Aerodrome, inside the ring of Bofus guns. He pauses, as if surprised at his own advice. But don't take any notice of their fighters. It's the big boys we've got to kill. My Spitfire's here, he says, prodding a map of the aerodrome with his thumb. Yours, he continues, glancing up at the CO, is there. And yours, Barnum, is up the other end there. Barnum, you'll have to taxi up the runway while I'm taking off down it. So keep over to your left. I'll take off on the right. Scramble on two red very lights. That seems crazy to me. If I taxi up the runway on the left and he takes off on the right, we'll have a head-on collision. But Gracie is impatiently gathering together his flying kit. Blast the takeoff then, it'll probably sort itself out. I attract his attention again. With the JU-88s in heaped formation, their return fire must be pretty concentrated. What's the best way through it? Return fire? Ignore it. Come on, let's get out there. The CO and I each grab parachutes and pursue him up the rock steps. Gracie is quickly in the driving seat of a Dodge car with its engine running. The CO jumps in front beside him and I climb in the back on top of the parachutes. This is a mad drive around the perimeter track, but bouncing wildly, I'm intrigued by the wavelets of curling dust flowing out each side of the car. Gracie brakes fiercely and stops. I hand the CO his flying kit. As he steps back, Gracie accelerates, past where Max's Spitfire was yesterday, past the road leading down into the remote valley of Safi, and pulls up beside a rock dispersal pen with a dark blue Spitfire in it for me. Hardly have I removed my kit before the Dodge car is disappearing in a cloud of dust. Left alone in the silence, I breathe deeply and look up at the intense blue sky. After all, there may be lots of time before the raid comes in. Looking around, I notice three airmen in khaki shorts coming out from behind the Spitfire to greet me. It's a good mount, this one, you'll like it, sir. 
Mind you bring it back, sir, says the second airman. The pilot who was here yesterday has had it. We moved his Spitfire across this morning. It's usually a lucky pen, this one. The third airman, with a long, bristly face and carrying some black material over his arm, doesn't say a word. His round eyes just stare. Don't mind Claudia, sir, I'm told. He's going round a bend. He's lost his screwdriver. Claude smiles as he offers me a black flying suit that someone must have left behind. I've never worn a flying suit in a Spitfire, but I remember as a boy with my heart full of thrilling sensations, watching the suited pilots climbing into their biplane fighters at the Hendon flying display. So I accept the gift, and in putting it on feel that I am substantiating another childhood dream. This corner of the aerodrome is delightful. A tree, from which strange long beans are hanging down, leans over the rock pen enclosing my Spitfire. Its leaves throw a pleasant shade onto some smooth ground where the airmen have been sitting. The tree frames the Spitfire in such a splendid way that I decide to do a drawing. A faint report from the far side of the aerodrome makes me look round. Two red lights are descending through the air above G-Shelter. No time for drawing. Scramble. In the cockpit, I wriggle my head into my new tropical flying helmet. Long tentacles of flame pour from the exhaust ports. The engine coughs into light. Clouds of dust spread out behind me as I swing out of the pen onto the rock-strewn road, racing towards the runway. I am strangely happy. The blue-grey metal of the curved wings sticking out each side of me look good against the delicate colours in the passing brown grass. The mechanical fumes from the engine and the sight of all the ticking instruments are familiar friendly things. Smiling inside my oxygen mask, I look across towards a group of Maltese workmen sitting on a rock wall, for, as I turn my Spitfire onto the runway, they stand up and stare back at me. Why do they stand up? A salute to all our pilots, perhaps? Bless them anyway. I give them a wave. Taxi on the left of the runway was what Gracie said. Watch out, though, that man's crazy. Swinging my Spitfire from side to side, I search diligently. That tiny aircraft trailing a dust plume in front of G Shelter must be Gracie. The CO's machine is converging from my right. As he crosses onto the runway, so his propeller blows a huge dust cloud back at me, dust spiralling above me into the sky, fiery in the sunlight like debris from a volcano. I can't see a thing. From out of the dust, a Spitfire rushing head on at me along the ground, swinging my machine off the runway violently over the rubble, the grass, the bumps, I glimpse Gracie's angry eyes. His aircraft was gigantic, but we haven't collided. This Malta is really a mad and wonderful island. The CO Spitfire is passing most discreetly on the other side of the runway, tail up for takeoff. At last, aware of the general direction in the dust clouds, I swing round and open the throttle wide, gathering speed more and more quickly and sweeping into the air. Wheels up and a steep turn to see where the others have got to. The landscape floods wide around me. Beautiful, beautiful to see the hills and rooftops and churches again. But this is war. Down there the sirens must be wailing. We are climbing higher into a rusty purple void. In all this haze I can't see the island or the sea. Only the two spitfires ahead of me and the glaring cyclopean eye of the sun staring down at us. 15,000 feet still in haze, Gracie turning left. I follow in a long stern chase as we dive back in the direction we've come from. I stare through the windscreen at Gracie's tiny Spitfire, closely followed by the COs, both turning slightly right in the distance. In front of the two retreating planes, a faint brown trace of the island with bursting anti-aircraft shells is looming towards us. Gracie steepens his dive, continues turning. We are plunging vertically, but I can see no enemy planes. There they are, JU-88, top plan view, 5, 7, 10, 20, 30, no time to count. Still more appear, all sweeping closer, all sizes extending in depth downwards like fishes in a tank, some very close, some far away below. Take one near the bottom, my Spitfire shudders as I fire two bursts of cannon into a cluster of bombers that get in the way. May have hit one, can't stop to look, my target is wheeling nicely into position. Ah, a huge part of a JU-88, nose and engine, flashes out from under my left wing, must have been right on top of him. Gone now, easing gently out of my dive, watching my graceful target flying backwards towards me, larger and larger in my gun sight. Quick search in all directions, lots of 88s, but no enemy fighters. Target's wings overlapping my windscreen, I fire. A flash and a burst of smoke from his port engine. He rears up in front of me, steep turning left, dash the man, deflection inside his turn. Can only just do it, fire again. He's swerving to the right, try for his starboard engine, fire again and again. Black smoke puffs on my left wing, balls of orange fire flashing past my cockpit, crackling in my ears. I plunge left, looking back over my left shoulder. For who the hell's hitting me? Nothing there, just an 88 hanging behind my tail. Can't be him. Swerve back again. My own 88 is drawn away a bit. A pretty thing, splaying two plumes of smoke that widen as they sweep back towards me. Very pale machine and very close to the water. I wonder if it's going to crash.
109s, two head-on views diving from my left, blinking with light, curling blue traces strand about me as I turn towards them. A third got my sight on him for an instant before he went under my nose. Still turning hard left, my helmet's too big for me. Turn, pressure pulls it over my eyes, can't see, stupid. Push it up and straighten out, that's better. Two more 109s from the right this time, turn in towards them, curl down on the last one, can't turn sharply enough. Damn the helmet! Another 109 below me, drop onto his tail. I'll get him all right. A gigantic shape, all rivets and oil streaks, the underside of a Messerschmitt blots out the sky, gone! But I'm still on a 109's tail. It's right there in front of me, pointing very slightly downwards. My aircraft shudders and shudders and shudders and shudders as I pour bullets and shells into it. It bursts with black smoke and topples over sideways. More 109's from the right. Turn, my Spitfire vibrates violently and the sea changes places with the sky. I'm spinning, opposite rudder and stick forwards. I'm level again. Two more from the right. Once again, my Spitfire flicks upside down. Steep cliffs and yellow ground hang above my head with black clouds among the buildings there. Bombs bursting. Corrective action was immediate for I'm the right way up once more. Bang! Explosion from my engine. Smoke bursting back into the cockpit. Upside down, spinning again. Cliffs very close. Controls don't answer. All gone slack. Can't stop spinning, spitfire burning, out of control. Too low to bail out, might just make it bail out quickly. But everything is going so slowly, oh, so slowly. I can see my right hand coming up gradually towards my helmet to throw it off. I can see my left hand in front of my face, trying to unfasten my oxygen mask, which is clamped tightly over my nose and mouth. I watch my fumbling fingers trying and trying and trying again to find out where the metal hook is placed. They seem to be slowly saying to myself, oh, so very slowly, you'll have to hurry up, Dennis, old chap. There's so very, very little time. But it's no good. I just can't undo all these pipes and wires. I'm too low now. No hope now. Can't avoid it. Going to be killed. The scene is strangely peaceful, for unconcerned and apparently unimplicated. I am outside my aeroplane, looking back at my body. In front of me is the wingtip, but my attention is drawn back along the upper surface of the wing, back over the painted roundel, to the wing root where the light is shining. Above the wing root is the cockpit, within the perspex canopy. I can see my own helmeted head with my arms encircling it in such a strange manner. I'm so interested in watching my body over there that I have but a faint impression of the aeroplane's long nose trailing horizontal smoke against a background of dark sea. Pressure. Controls do respond. Hope. Not going to be killed after all. Smoke's not bad. 109s, pretend I'm crashing, might leave me alone. Diving, deliberately lurching, down, down, down to white surf at the foot of the cliffs. Rolling sideways, I look back at the enemy planes. 109s, high up behind me, watching, and I hope convinced by my trick. Cliffs towering above me, climb, quickly, sweeping upwards over the cliff brink. The Malta landscape reappears. Another huge burst of smoke from the engine. Smoke now pouring from the cowling, covers just in front of my windscreen. Throttle dead. Engine dead. 109's after me. Ignore them. Got to put this plane down somewhere. But where? Where? Sinking, I drop my left wing. Patterns of walls. Fields much too small. I'd crash horribly. Searching desperately, I drop the right wing. Worn tracks where aircraft have taken off. An aerodrome. Turning and sinking, I'm much too close to it. Side slipping with stick fully back. Full top rudder and the wings and body shuddering and shaking. The brittle skeletons of what must have been huge hangars rush up to meet me. I'm landing downwind, overshooting. Far walls will break me to bits. No wheels then, belly landing. Turning over the broken hangar, I tighten up the straps. Don't want to bash my brains on the gun sight. But floating, still floating. Aerodrome shrinking, walls coming. Rudder away from that bomb hole. Stick back, 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 crump. Nose has dropped. I'm tossed forward but held in straps. Tail high in the air. I'm hanging in the straps. But now, as the tail drops and we revert to the horizontal in a cloud of dust. What relief. I've done it. I'm down safely. Reaching towards me, zigzag across the ground, dust spurts, clattering machine guns, thump, thump, thump of 109 cannons. Out of cockpit, onto wing I run, but RT wires attached to my helmet head tug at me, dragging me back. I wrench off the accursed helmet and run, run for the nearest bomb hole, all broken white rock, my flying suit black, trying to be invisible. I lie panting, pressing myself down, waiting for the thud of bullets. I waited and waited. The silence was uncanny. Finally, I looked up. It was difficult to believe, but the 109s had gone. The ambulance sped out towards me. Group Captain Thomas, the officer commanding this aerodrome of Halfa, came out in his car, and together we examined the bullet holes in my smoking Spitfire. The group captain has now brought me to sick quarters. 
Here, with the spewed bomb rubble beside us, brilliant white, sunlit against the velvet blue, in silence, for the bomb rumble in the distance seems utterly remote. I am at peace. I am drinking a long draught of clear, sparkling water. As I drink, I notice through the bottom of the glass a low wall with figures behind it. As I lower the glass, I see it as a group of Maltese peasants watching us intently. Thanking the group captain, I'm climbing out of my black flying suit. I'm surprised to see my own knees reappearing one by one at the end of my khaki shorts. A tall flight lieutenant describing how the 14 or 20 109s against which I fought followed me in shakes me by the hand. I've never seen flick rolls used in combat before, he tells me. Alas, I reply. They were unintentional spins. The Maltese peasants are coming down the road towards us. As they pass, the nearest, a very fat woman, looks into my face with searching eyes, holds my elbow and presses something into my hand. I smile, but I don't know what to say to her. As she moves on, I look down. It is a small rectangular card, worn and rubbed, her prayer card, marked with a little white cross and the words Verbum Dei Caro Factum Est. I look back to thank her, but she is gone. Now the return to Luca. After collecting my tin hat and sketching things and apologising to the airmen whom we found watching the sky for my returning Spitfire, telling them it would not come back, I follow Group Captain Thomas, who has kindly driven me here, steeply down into G Shelter Cavern. Gracie stares at me angrily. So, you're alive, are you, you... He says, you nearly pranged us both at takeoff. I stared back at him. Of course I'm alive. And the takeoff? It's irrelevant to argue about that. Angry at such a welcome, I retreat back up the stone steps. Pancho... Max, Scotty, Cyril, Hugh and the rest of the pilots of our squadron gather round me in the sunlight. They are telling me how Gracie returned from the action. Your CO's had it. Barnum's dead too. I damaged 288s, was all that he'd said. Isn't the CO back? I ask in alarm. No, they reply. He's missing. This moment is final, ruthless, inevitable. Dead. I look round at the sunlit hillsides, which we have trodden for just 24 hours.